Good morning. Welcome to Cornerstone again. Uh, I am really excited about starting this series. We've been in a, a season throughout the summer of doing some good topical studies on some uh, a bunch of issues that, and questions that people have, and it's been awesome, but it's always good to kind of just to kind of jump back in. Let's just go through a book of the Bible together. I love doing that, and I love studying, and there's so many great sermon series out there on the book of James. If you want to listen to some that are out there, uh, David Platt has a good series. Matt Chandler has a great series. That video is actually that we showed there at the beginnings from Matt Chandler's series. Um, and I um, actually emailed them after I saw them. I'm like, man, can we use this in our church? And they're like, yeah, sure. So I, it, it's neat to see churches kind of, uh, you know, sharing the resources a little bit. Uh, Beth Moore has a great study on the book of James. There's just so many good resources. And James is one of those books that just, it grabs your attention. It's short, it's concise, it speaks clearly into our life. And, and here's what I want to do this morning. I, before I jump in, I do want to give you a little bit of a background on the book because it's a little hard to just jump right in and, and talk about a book until you know who wrote it, when it was written, why it was written, all those background stuff. So first of all, who wrote the book of James? Your first quiz this morning, who wrote it? James, good job. The first service, they were like, I'm not sure. And um, they were all like too scared to, to shout it out. And, and now, but th this is where it gets interesting, which James, because there's more than one James in the Bible, Right. We have James, the brother of John, but from church history, we find out that he was martyred. He was killed very early, um, and so he is not the author of this book, James, the brother of, of John, one of the 12 disciples. That leaves us with who is James. He's actually the brother of Jesus, and this is where it starts to get interesting. He is the younger brother of Jesus. He's they. So most scholars think he is the oldest of the rest of the family. He is technically a half-brother, right? Because same mom, different dad, if you get what I'm saying. Um, his mom or Mary, you know, his mom was married, dad was Joseph, where Jesus had a heavenly father. So we have a little bit of difference here. Now, the other interesting thing about James is that during the life of Jesus, he was not really a believer. Um, in fact, we actually can read in John 7 and and we see that they came to take Jesus away. You know, his brother showed up on the scene like, okay, you're crazy. We're going to have you committed. And now I can tell you, if I have an older brother, if he just suddenly started telling everybody, hey, I'm God, you know, I think we would think, yeah, you're probably crazy, right? And that's what his brothers did. That's just kind of human. They're like, what are you talking about? You're my brother. You're not like, you know. And so we see that there was, uh, James was a skeptic. And, and that's what's interesting. This book was written by somebody that at one point in their life was a skeptic, but something changed in the life of James that forever changed him. And what was that? It was the resurrection. Because when James saw Jesus crucified, you know, beaten, tortured, put to death, put in a tomb for three days, and then Jesus came back to life, you know what? It kind of changed his mind. <laughs> I think it would change our mind as well. When he encountered the risen Lord, his life was forever changed. And then what's great about James is we see in the early church, almost immediately, he becomes one of the leaders of the early church. And we see that the early church with, um, um, with Peter and, and with John and, and with James, then became, kind, of, kind of became the three founding fathers, the three pillars, so to speak, of the early church. And we see them become leaders. We read about uh, James in Acts 15 and in Acts 21, um, when, they, when James is, is presented as an elder of the Jerusalem church. He became an influential leader um, that really w that was a, just incredibly passionate about sharing the message of Jesus. And he even, um, we can read about him in church history in Fox's Book of Martyrs. It talks about James. Um, he even, he, he died around the year 62 A.D. And when he died, he was actually taken, they, they captured him um, because he was preaching about Jesus. They took him to the top of the temple, told him to deny Jesus. He refused. They threw him off the top of the temple. Um, and he landed and he did not die. And then the church history speaks about this and says that 
Um, even when they got to him um, to, to, to murder him and to, to finish the job, to kill him, so to speak, he was praying for the very people who had just thrown him off the temple. That's the kind of man James was. He was called James the Just. He, he had a nickname in the early church. They called him Camel Knees because he spent so much time on his knees in prayer. And, and that's what I love about the, the, the book of James here. This is written by a guy that backs up what he shares here. He's the real deal. He's a guy that was not afraid to share what he thought. Now, it's like a sermon. It's like all these quick moving statements. Uh, I can almost like picture, you know, put it in our time. It'd be like the disciples, you know, and all these the people listening to the, the message. They would hear something James said, and then they're like, oh, man, we got to tweet that. I mean, that's like how James talks. I mean, everything is just like this short little phrase that you go, ooh, that was good. And so I find myself, I'm like reading through James this week. I'm like, ooh. Oh, ooh, yeah, mm, mm, that's good, mm, that's good. And, and that's just how James kind of speaks to you. I mean, it kind of gets your attention as you're reading through it. Uh, I mean, just things that really stick with you. It starts out in verse 1, and, and this is what, I, uh, again, you see James a little bit of his heart. He said, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. Now, I don't know about you, but when I'm around people that... Um, that name drop, it really annoys me. Have you ever been around somebody that does that? You're around them and they're, they're immediately, well, I know so-and-so and I'm related to so-and-so and, and hey, I, yeah, I, I was there and I know this. And, and you go, really? Are you that insecure that you have to tell everyone who you are and who you know and, and how important you are? This is what I love about James. He starts off this book and, he did a, he, and it doesn't start out, um, James, a brother to Jesus of and, and somebody that is very, you know, no, he just says, I'm James, and who am I? I'm a servant. Literally, I'm a slave. He, he starts off this book, I'm a slave of God. Doesn't mention his family affiliation. Doesn't mention who he knows. He just says, hey, I'm just a slave of God. And we see very humbly he started out this book, and he's writing it to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations um, in Acts chapter 7 and 8, we read about Stephen and, 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 his, and how he was martyred, how he was killed, how he was persecuted, and, and he lost his life. And, and at that point in Jerusalem, the early church had grown to thousands and thousands of people. At that point, though, a persecution broke out against the Christians. In Acts 8, we see that the church started scattering and it started being dispersed. And that's actually the word that's used there, the diaspora. To, uh, he's writing to the 12 tribes that were dispersed, who were scattered among the nation. So he's writing to all these believers that started out in Jerusalem, and now they're spread out all over the place. Another interesting fact about this book, since James was killed in 62 AD, it was written before that. And so, honestly, most people think it was written between like 44 and maybe the mid-50s A.D., which places this, and it could very well be the very first letter, the very first book of the New Testament. And that's, that's amazing. The very, you think that there had been 400 years of silence since the Old Testament, and the first book that was written um, as part, that became part of the canon of the New Testament Scripture was the book of James. And written by the brother of Jesus. So that's, that's kind of the background in a nutshell. I hope that kind of helps give you a little bit of a feel for who James is. And, 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 and so then the question becomes, why do we study James? Why do we study James? Here's the first reason. If you're following along, you can follow along on the YouVersion Bible app or on your sermon guide there. The first reason is to learn the relationship between faith and works. James does an incredible job of kind of painting this picture that both are important. Out of 108 verses in James, there are 59 different commands. That's a command every two verses. All over the place, he talks about obedience. Obedience is important. And, and you know, in today's time, it's like everybody's like, well, Christianity is not a list of do's and don'ts. And, and people will say, don't judge me. You have no right to tell me what to do. I can live my life however I want. I, I'm a believer, but it, I, you know, it's up to me to live my life. And, and James says, you know what? You've got it wrong. James says, it does matter what you do. Do your actions back up what you believe? Do, do your works match your faith? 
And, and so we see James just kind of just jump right in and say, it matters how you live your life. Do your words and your actions match? Now, I, I really think if James had a church today, he wouldn't be that popular. People would think, man, he's too harsh. He expects too much out of us. Uh, I mean, when we read the book of James, you say, well, really? I mean, can we live like this? And the answer is yes. Uh, with the power of God, we can. And James challenges us. And, and he just, I mean, he is just, he just confronts us. He gets in our face and lets us know it matters what you believe. Now, that's kind of the first reason is he kind of describes here how faith and works go together. The second reason is he shares how faith impacts our everyday life. Now, your faith, your belief in God, your trust in God, it changes how you live your life. And James says here, if you say you believe in me, then your actions change, your beliefs change, your, your passion changes, your desire changes. Everything about your life, your priorities change. Everything in your everyday life is changed because of that faith. And, and, this, and, and this is what gets me excited about studying this book a little bit, is, is I truly believe that as a church, when we go through this, it's going to change us. I can think back over the past 11 years now, of course, it's hard to even fathom it's been that long, right? 11 years. There are certain series I look back throughout the years and I think, man, that, that series changed us. God used that to, to work in our hearts and kind of build up a passion in us. Or he used that to kind of refocus us and bring us back to, to, to be the church he's called us to be. I truly believe that this is one of those series. I just, I'm telling you, as I've studied, as I've prepared, as I, I mean, I'm just, when I get in this book, it, you can't help but be changed by what you read here in this book. I think this, this series can have a radical effect on us as individuals and on, on our church. So the, the, what I want to jump right into this morning, um, and I really think if I had to kind of summarize this whole entire book, here's how I would summarize it. That you aren't as mature as you think. I really think that's James's message to us. You aren't as mature. Maybe you're not, you need to grow up a little bit. You need to mature in your faith. And now the rest of the book, he's kind of going to explain that. What does that look like for a believer? And the first thing we jump into in verse 2 through 18 this morning is about trials and temptations. Um, you're not as mature as you think. You're going to face trials and temptations, so how do you respond to them? And, and so the, you know, the first thing this morning, why do we face trials? Why do we face trials? They're going to be inevitable in our life, and God will use them to deepen our faith. That's why we face trials. One of the reasons God uses them to, to deepen our faith. If you got your Bibles, open to James chapter 1. Here's your first little exercise this morning. Look at James chapter 1. In that passage, verse 1 through 18, kind of look at every time the word trials, tribulation, some versions trouble. Um, sometimes it's used as a noun. Sometimes it's used as a verb. Kind of look. You can highlight those, kind of mark them, kind of circle them. Uh, however you want to do that, if you got your Bible with you, you can highlight them on the app. Um, but just look at how many times he mentions trials, troubles, and tribulations. Here's what I want you to realize. In the Greek, that's the same root word for all of those times. James is making a point here. The, you're going to face trouble in this life. You are not guaranteed an easy life. So how we respond to trials and temptations, it shows a lot about our faith. And he's challenging us here. Sometimes we face trials on the outside. Sometimes we face temptations on the inside. And how we understand them and how we respond to them has everything to do with our faith. And, and so let's just jump right in. Verse 2, um, James chapter 1. This is James's words here. Harsh, hard-hitting words. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith, it produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, 
not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, get this now, if you need wisdom, then ask. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts, it's like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position, but the rich should take pride in their humiliation since they will pass away uh, like a wildflower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant, its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, the person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let's be honest here for a minute. When things go good in life, when things go good in life, you get a job, you get a new job, you get a promotion. How do we respond? We kind of pat ourselves on the back and say, man, I worked hard for this. I deserve this. Man, I'm good. Don't we? I mean, honestly, don't. sometimes when things go good, we say, man, man, I deserve this. And then when things go bad, what happens? We start whining, God, why do you let this happen to me? I don't deserve this. Don't you see everything I'm doing for you? God, why did this happen to me? Why, why me out of all people? And so when things go good, we, we, we take full responsibility for that and say, man, I'm good. And then when things go bad, we say, God, it's your fault. <laughs> That's kind of how we go through life sometimes. And, and, and James is saying here, wait a minute. God is sovereign over everything, over all your life. And so trials are never out of, they're never outside of God's control. And he can take those trials and he can take those troubles and he can use them to shape us, to mold us, to build us to be the person that he wants to be. We see that he accomplishes his purposes through our trials and troubles in life. Now let me ask you this morning, um, I think if you're like me, you look at this and you say, man, I, this is one of those passages you say, I wish this wasn't even in the Bible. I mean, this is hard. I wanna, I, we don't want a hard life. Uh, we, we think, man, don't we deserve to have an easy life, a fun life, a life that, that we can enjoy? And God is saying, wait a minute, what's your goal in life? Is your goal in life uh, just to kind of coast through life? Or is your goal in life to be shaped and to be formed to be more like Christ? And that's really kind of, he's hitting at the foundation here of why, well, what's our purpose in life? What's our purpose? So there, there's a danger out there, and it seems like I, I, I pick on it sometimes, but there's a, uh, there's a lot of preachers on TV and, and that talk about God wants you to be healthy. God wants you to be happy. God wants you to have a great life. God wants you to be wealthy and have everything you want and everything you desire. If you just name it, you claim it, you pray for it, God will bless you with it. You have the problem with that, that's not the gospel. Uh, that's not the message of Christ. Uh, James's message is, hey, you're going to go through trials in life. You cannot escape them. You're going to have trouble in life. And God is going to use those to make you mature and complete so you don't lack anything. God does not guarantee you an easy life. In fact, He tells you without a doubt, you will face trouble. And I say that this morning knowing that there's people in this room who are right in the midst of that trial and tribulation. There are people who are struggling. There are people who are hurting. There are people who are saying, God, I, I just don't know if I can keep going through this. There's also people in here and you say, I've not really experienced that yet. Maybe you're young enough where that hasn't hit you, and, and, but you're on that path. And I'm telling you, it's in your future. Prepare for it now because it will come. Trials and tribulation will come come matt chandler says that the theme of this entire passage is trials will come and we are to count them all as joy why because god is good god is good and if he's good then he's going to use everything that happens to us to build us up so when james says consider it pure joy this is a command 
This addresses not just how we think and how we feel, but how we act. Consider it all joy. Now, I'm not telling you this, uh, you know, don't go up to somebody who's going through the midst of suffering or I mean, don't go up to somebody at the funeral home and say, suck it up, count it all, it's all joy. You should get over it. You should be joyful in this. No, don't do that. That's not, that's not what he's telling us here. And we see Jesus in, in John 11 when his friends Mary and Martha were, were mourning Lazarus and, and his death that Jesus came up with him. He hugged him. He spent time with him. He wept with them. He entered into their pain. He didn't say, count it all as joy. No, when we can weep, we can mourn. But he's saying, you know what? You've got to realize the purpose of what you're going through. And that when we do that, when we, how can we experience joy? It's when we realize that everything that happens to us is under the authority of a sovereign God and He is accomplishing His purposes through those trials. When we realize everything that happens, it's under God's control. He's using us, using those troubles, those trials. He's using those to build us up, to shape us, to mold us, to be the person He wants us to be, to be more like Jesus. And so in verse 3 and 4, he begins to pile on the way that God uses these trials to build us up. You know, it, you know all this, he's encouraging them. Um, and he's just telling them that the testing of your faith develops endurance and perseverance. And it's, it, you be mature and complete. And, and God's goal in our life is not for us to be happy, not to us to be wealthy, not to us... Uh, no, his goal in our life is for us to be more like Jesus. And that's why we can be joyful even in the midst of trials because God will use those trials to make us more like Jesus. And so if, if that becomes our goal, then we can start understanding that anything that happens to us, it's moving us to be more like Jesus. It kind of changes our perspective about our problems. Hebrews 12 tells us this, that Jesus, uh, He's the pioneer, the perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before Him, He endured the cross scorning its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. See, when we get in the midst of our problems, we've got to just lift up our eyes to Jesus and realize that whatever we're going through, our, our goal is still Jesus. We want to be like him. We want to live like him. We want to love like him. We want to serve like him. We want to share everything about Jesus with everyone we meet. And so that becomes our, our we understand that. Here's another question for you this morning. I want you to kind of think back through your life. When are the times that you grew up, you matured the fastest? Just think about that for a second. What are those events in your life that triggered big periods of growth, spiritual growth? The, the reality is for, for almost everyone, what causes growth in our lives are hardships. We go through something that is painful, we learn through it, we grow, our faith strengthens, and we realize that God is there for us. And again, that's what we see right here. That's why we go through trials. They deepen our faith. Verse 5 tells us they deepen our faith, and we, can, we, we need to receive wisdom. Uh, and we receive wisdom through that. Um, now, Verse 5 is clear that we're not as mature as we think we are. We're not as wise as we think we are. So we need to ask God for wisdom. Um, but here's where it gets a little, little tricky, right? How do we gain wisdom? We can gain wisdom through knowledge. We can increase our knowledge, right? We gain wisdom through perspective, through being able to see our situation from a different view. We can also gain, gain wisdom through experience. And that's kind of the painful way. And so what God says here, if you need wisdom, I've got the experience, you know, I've got the perspective, I've got the knowledge, I know everything, just come to me and ask. And one of the most beautiful promises in Scripture, I will give you generously when you ask. Now it also, though, here, it kind of gives us this warning, right? Don't come to me double-minded. Don't come to me with one foot in the world and one foot, foot uh, uh, you know, in the church saying that you, you need my help. God is not this cosmic slot machine that we put our quarter in and hope we hit the jackpot and hope we win and hope He answers us. No, He's saying, will you come to me? Let's look at verse 6 um, and 7 here. It says, but when you ask Him, be sure that your faith is in, um, is, is in God alone. Do not waver. 
Don't, don't waver. Don't go say, well, God, I, I'm, I, you know, I'm going to ask you, but I'm going to go over here and make my plans because I know you're not going to answer it. No, he's saying, do not waver for a person with divided loyalties as unsettled as a wave of the sea that's blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Their loyalty is divided between God and the world. And they are unstable, double-minded, right, in everything they do. This is where it's tough. This is God saying, come to me if you need wisdom. I'll give it to you, but don't doubt. Come to me, and, 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 and I'll give you what you need, but don't have one foot in the world and one foot in the church. So the question then becomes, how much faith does it take for God to hear us, for God to answer us, for God to deliver us? I think we see that uh, in Mark chapter 9. And we go to Mark chapter 9, uh, a father comes up to Jesus. His son is suffering. Um, he's saying that, you know, my child, he's been suffering from childhood. It's this spirit. It's thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But, if, but, and here's his question to Jesus. If you can do anything. And you see this desperation in his voice, right? If you can do anything, Jesus, take pity on him and on us and, and help him. And, and he says, and Jesus answers, if, if you can, everything. It's possible for the one who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe, but, but help my unbelief, Jesus. And so here we see this, this man, he, doesn't, he just comes to Jesus and he says, I don't know where, what to, I, I believe. I really do, but, but I don't help my unbelief, help my doubt, help my fears. And, and he's, he's not running away saying, okay, I, yeah, whatever. No, he's saying, help me. And that's when Jesus hears him. And so when we look at this, when God says, I will give you wisdom, but don't doubt, he's saying, come to me, trust me, I, I'm here for you. Just, just, keep, just, just put your trust in me. And he can take whatever sliver of faith we have, he can bless it. And like a good father, he will generously pour out wisdom to us. Trials also, they deepen our faith, they teach us to rely on God. In verse 9 through 11, we see, man, riches and poverty. And we'll see this again throughout the book. So I won't spend a lot of time on it this morning. But, and, and here's what happens. When we go through trials, it kind of levels everything out. It doesn't matter if you're rich. It doesn't matter if you're poor. You have to rely on God. If you have a lot of money, you can put your trust in your money and your possessions to save you. If you have nothing... I mean, you tend to blame God and God say, no, whatever, whether you are rich, whether you are poor, and he's writing to, to mostly poor people here. And he's saying, whatever you have or don't have, you need to trust in God. One day, all that stuff is going to be gone away. It's going it's to be gone. It's going to be burned up. It's going to be gone. Do you trust in me? And then verse 12 talks about that crown of life when we persevere. Um, the, the picture here for the, the listeners hearing it, uh, at the end of a race, uh, a runner received a, a, a wreath, a, a crown that was put on their head when they finished. Now, my kids are running a little bit and doing some races this year, and I used to run years ago before I was old and fat. And um, here's what I remember about running, okay? When I ran, I mean, in the middle of a race, it hurts, in the middle of a race, you have, all, it's, 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 you have so much going on in your mind. You're like, is, I'm going to die, one of those things. It goes through your mind. You're like, I'm going to throw up, which is another thing that goes through your mind, and sometimes you do. Um, man, i, I got to tell you this side story. One time, in, um, we were at this big cross-country meet in high school, and um, the principal decided to come out and support us at the race. And so he stood at the finish line, was trying to shake everybody's hands as we come through the, the finish line at the end of the race. So one of the guys was running, and he's like, and the principal was like, you know, and he just went, Poof, and it was, it was awesome. Um, all right, I mean, when you go through a race, it's, I don't know why I shared that, but anyway, I mean, you go through life, and when you're running, I mean, you feel like you're going to die, your body thinks it's going to die, and you, get, you go through all this hardship, and then when you get to the end and you finish, all of a sudden you forget all that stuff during the race. You're just joyful. You're just glad you're alive, <laughs> You're just glad, and you're like, where's food? Because I want to eat, I want to celebrate, I want to I eat. You know, that's what happens when you run and you get to the end. I tell you, that is life. God is waiting to put a wreath on our head when we persevere in faith and we get there, and, and we're going to forget some of these trials and troubles and tribulation. And why, they made us stronger. They made us more like Jesus. But when we get to the end, there's a crown of life 
waiting for us. I love that. I love that picture. God is in control. He loves his children. And our trials, our tribulations, they deepen our faith in him. Uh, what else do trials do? They force us to look inward. Again, we don't really like this sometimes. They force us to look inward. Verse 13, let's keep going. He says, when tempted, no one says God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, it gives birth to death. James wants to protect us from something here. You see, when in our minds, our, our minds kind of get out of control sometimes. And, and when bad things happen, we take the next step and we automatically say, well, God is doing this, or God is causing this, or God is, is trying to, to, to make me deny him. And, and how, do, how does this happen? When we face financial difficulty, we're tempted to say, God, I can't trust you. I, I, I've got to work this out on my own. When, we, when someone dear to us dies, we, we, we question God's love. God, you really love me. You, know, you wouldn't allow this to happen. When we experience unjust suffering, we say, God, are you really just? A good God would not allow this to happen here on our earth and on our planet. How could this be? And, and we question God. And James is saying, wait a minute, where does evil come from? Where is evil? It doesn't come from God. God is good. His nature is good. His character is good. He is perfect in everything. God is good. So evil comes from Satan. And that evil, what happens then? He, he entices us. And it, James is just making us realize we are sinful. We are depraved. We are capable of doing great evil things. That's why Jesus came. He came to rescue us from that. He came to, to pay the penalty for that sin in our life. He came to rescue us and pull us out of that. He came to, 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 to take our shame, to take our condemnation. We are sinful, evil people, and we need a Savior. I'm telling you, people, you, you can't get saved until you realize you're lost. You can't get saved until you realize you need rescue. Uh, and naturally, we are evil. And he said in verse 14, each person you're tempted when you're drawn away and enticed by your own evil desires. We've got to look inward. Trials do that. They make us look inward. What are we doing here? And so maybe we need to take responsibility for the temptation and sin we're dealing with. In this world, everybody likes to blame someone else. It's the government's fault. Obama did it. All right? We, we go and we, uh, we blame our parents the way we were raised. We blame our teachers. It's their fault. We blame everything and everybody. It's our spouse's fault. If they just treated me right, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be cheating on them. That's what, that's what, I mean, people like to blame everybody else. James says it's your own evil desires. And he gives us this progression that takes place, a kind of a four-step progression of sin. First, there's deception. Satan tries to deceive us. Right? We see this in the Garden of Eden. Genesis 3, Satan shows up. Did God really say that? Did, did God really say, did God really say that sex outside of marriage is bad? And so people say, ah, it's not that big of a deal. We just do it anyway, right? And then we see the next step from, from deception to desire. And that desire is when all of a sudden our mind kind of goes there and starts thinking, oh, that, that could be good. Oh, I would like that. I, I, I deserve that. Oh, man, you just don't understand. We rationalize sin, right? And that's when that desire kind of takes hold of us. It, it goes from deception where we, we kind of buy, the, buy into the lie, then we start having that desire, uh, right? I mean, you think about adultery. It doesn't start with a physical act. It starts with deception and it leads to desire. And then it leads to disobedience when we finally act on that desire. And then from there, uh, James tells us that sin has a logical, a natural progression. It ends in death. And don't tell me that sin cannot end in death, right? Because I've seen it so many times. I've seen it over and over again, whether it's addiction that leads to death, whether it's um, despair and, and suicide that comes as a result of, of sin. I've just seen what, what sin can do in the lives of people. I haven't shared a whole lot about it, but there's um, on the news, it's been in the news a lot, the, the, the website Ashley Madison, right? It's, it's been... Um, 
if you if you don't know about this, um, there was a website, and it, it existed for the sole purpose. Their slogan was "Life is short, have an affair." I mean, just think about that for a minute. How evil that is, right? Life is short, so just have an affair. So people could log in, have an account, um, and and get hooked up with other people who were wanting to to cheat on their spouse. And the site was hacked, and all the users of the site were put out on the internet. Um, and so, just you, you think about something, your sin will find you out, <laughs> right? And that's why I mentioned the site because if you're stupid enough to put to go there and check it out, your sin you can't hide from God. Now, what's been amazing is all those names have kind of come to light. It took down some celebrities and all that. And the sad thing is, there's been a number of suicides as the, the truth came out, and people couldn't deal with the sin. Uh, Christianity Today shared that there would be 400 pastors and church leaders step down as a result of the leak. I tell you, the sin, don't think, you're not as mature as you think you are. You're not as mature. We need to, to be knocked down a notch. James is saying, you've got to, rec- you've got to look inward. You've got to recognize those evil desires You've got to realize the deception before it turns into disobedience. Because sin has consequences. It will take you farther than you ever want to go. And I'm just telling you, we've got to realize that. We've got to look inward. Uh, Thomas Akempis put it this way. He said, at first, it is a mere thought confronting the mind. And then imagination paints it in stronger colors. Only after that do we take pleasure in it. And then we will make it a false move. And then we will give our assent to it. And so what we see here, sin, when it is full grown, it becomes a habit. It becomes a habit. Whatever sin you're dealing with, James is clear. Get away from it. Run from it. Flee from it. Recognize that Satan is deceiving you. Um, quit making excuses. Take responsibility for your own actions. And then finally, this morning, what, what do, you know, if, if, we, if we just ended right there, that'd be kind of depressing, right? We're evil, we're sinful, there's desire, all this. I love that James just keeps going, though. And what James does here, he points our our focus back on God, on God's goodness, on God's greatness. And the last thing, they put our focus back on God. That's what trials do. They deepen our faith. They make us look inward. And then it puts our focus on God where it belongs. Verse 16, don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Everything good, every good and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be the kind of first fruits of all that he created. God does not change. He is faithful. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. God is good. He never gets in a bad mood. Think about that for a minute. He never, he, he, God, God is for you, not against you. I, I, when we realize that, I, I know we're undeserving of His goodness, right? We deserve something much worse, but yet God in His love and God in His grace and God in His mercy extends forgiveness to us. And He does that through Jesus Christ. This is what God says here in this passage, right? You're the kind of a first fruits. He's saying we are his prized possessions, right? In Ephesians 2.10, right after Paul says that we are saved by grace, not by works, so that we don't boast. What do you think? Wait, is that in contradiction of what we just read? No, because he goes on in Ephesians 2.10 and says, For we are his workmanship. We are his masterpiece. We are his poema. Uh, the poetry of God. He has created us. We are His masterpiece. And why we're created to do good works. The message of James is the same as the message of Paul. God loves us. God saves us. But God is not done with us when we come to Him in, in, in faith. It's just the start of a process that's a lifelong process where we start, our, everything in our life is changed. We are sanctified. We become more and more like Jesus as time goes on. As we learn more, as we experience more, as we come to know more of who God is and His nature, we are changed into the image of Christ. 
And that's the message here. This, the, the gospel is that, that we have nothing but bad in us. And yet God loves us anyway. He comes to save us. He comes to rescue us. He has poured out the penalty for all of our bad, all of our sin, and He's poured it out on His Son, Jesus Christ. And Jesus paid that penalty in full when He died on the cross for you and for me. And so our trials, they just put our focus back on God. We look to Jesus, and we can be thankful for what He has done. Romans 1, 8, or 8, 18, I mean. Romans 8, 18 says, I consider that our present sufferings they're not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. I know you may be going through some tough times, but here's what I know. In light of eternity, it does not compare. It does not compare. Romans 8.31 says, What shall we say in response to this? Then? If God is for us, who can be against us? And so this morning, here's my question for you. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what trials you are facing but here's what I do know. God is good. And God cares about you. God loves you. And God loves you so much that Jesus came, lived a perfect life, and died a perfect death so that you could be saved, that you could be rescued. And if you're going through trials, can you really honestly say, I'm counting in His joy because God is using this to make me more like Him. This cancer can teach me humility. Or this, uh, this, this relationship problem is teaching me patience. Or I'm learning perseverance because of this affliction that I have. I can count it all as joy, though. I can count it all as joy because God is good. And God is using everything I go through in life to make me more like Him. I'm going to ask the praise team to come back up this morning. We're going to close this morning with another song. And Mark, as we kind of close, I just want to ask that you all bow your heads for a minute. And I want you to take a minute. Let's just kind of examine our own life. What is it that you're going through in life that you've lost focus a little bit? That, that you've taken your eyes off of God and you put, you've put them on your problem instead? Well, what is it in your life that you're struggling with? Let's, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we examine our own hearts, our own life, Lord, let us be able to recognize the, the deception, the deceit of Satan. Where he tries to, 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 to entice us to uh, your word. It even the pictures of, of a bait on a hook where he's trying to, to, to bait us in or, or to trap us into, into doing wrong and into to leaving you and, and just to, 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 to just walk right into sin. Lord, help us to realize that. Help us to realize that we go through trouble and trials not to deny you, but to, to turn to you. That you can use even the worst, even the, 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 even the worst experiences we have in life, Lord, can be used to make us more like Jesus. And we thank you for that. We can count it as joy, even when we struggle. Lord, I pray for this church. I, I really, I truly pray for each and every person in here. Uh, that you would strengthen them in their time of trial, in their time of tribulation. Uh, that you would give them uh, just a, a renewed strength to continue fighting for good. That you would give them a renewed strength to keep their eyes on you. And Lord, I pray for those people who are in this church this morning who would say, I never really put my trust and faith in Jesus Christ. For them this morning, Lord, I know that right now is a moment that could change their life forever. If they would just trust you. The Bible says if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord. And we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead. We will be saved. It's that act of belief. That act of faith. When we say Jesus. I believe you. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that I am sinful. I am in need of a savior. And you came to rescue me. And I believe that you rose from the dead. To pay, you paid the penalty for my sin. Then you defeated death. And now I can live and reign with you forever. That's your prayer this morning. It's nothing fancy, nothing complicated. Just a heartfelt conversation between you and God. Here's what I want you to know. God will save you. He will change your life forever. Heavenly Father, we just thank you this morning. You are so good. You are so great. You are so loving. You are so kind. You never change. You never give up on us. And because of that, Lord, we can praise you. We can worship you. And we can lift up your name. And we can share about Jesus with everyone. Lord, just thank you this morning. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
This morning you can fill out your communication card if there's any type of commitment you made, any prayer request you have, any type of questions you have. I encourage you to do that. Um, we're going to stand up sing one more song. I'll be in the back if you need to pray, if you've got any questions, if you've got anything at all. Let's stand and let's close together.